Today on The State of Us, the danger of generational stereotypes from climate change to jobs and cancel culture. Welcome to The State of Us. I'm your host, Justin T. Weller, joined, of course, today by your friendly redneck liberal, Mr. Lance L. Jackson. And we've got a full docket, as always, on The State of Us. We're looking at the danger of generational stereotypes, specifically five sort of generational myths that we're looking to debunk today, from baby boomers to Generation Z and everything in between. We're going to break those down, talk about them, but also talk about two realities that get buried under the noise of generational stereotypes. That said, we couldn't begin the critical conversation today, Lance, without a word of the day. Well, we're going to begin with the word that means to begin, Genesis, G-E-N-E-S-I-S. The genesis of creation or of problems or all kinds of things. Right. Sometimes known as the first book of the Christian Bible uh, because of the is that account the definition? of the creation of the universe. No. Definition that <clears throat> I'm just saying that that's where most people know it. I choose the word because it does mean the way in which something comes to be, the beginning or the origin. It is interesting that this idea of old people becoming frustrated with the younger generations can find its way all the way back to 400 BC in the written word from a guy named Socrates, actually Socrates. But if you are a fan of Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, like I am, they pronounced it Socrates. But um, Socrates moaned about the youth of his day and their quote, bad manners, contempt for authority and disrespect for elders. So there's the genesis of this generational infighting that goes on. It's as old as time incarnate, as long as people have lived long enough for there to be generations. Because you you have to take into account that for many, many hundreds of thousands of years, people didn't live long enough for there to be more than two generations. So, uh, but Socrates is the first recorded to say, daggone those young people, they're going to ruin it for everybody. We could say the genesis of old people being upset with young people and railing against them dates all the way back to Genesis? No. No? I would not say that. Okay. You would not say that, but one could say that. Because Socrates was after Genesis. Well, I mean, it could have started before Socrates, but... Could have, but that's the first recorded, and we deal with facts yeah. here oh, 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 on, okay. on the state of us, oh, oh. not opinions. Oh, okay. At least that's what I've always been told. Every time I think we all every time I try to give an opinion, I'm told we just deal with the facts here. Uh, Okay, Lance, we we don't talk about opinions. Where's the facts to back it up? So okay, I'm I'm just that's why I quoted Mr. Socrates uh, because he's the first one that published it. Well, uh, speaking of facts, let's let's discuss some facts. Um, there's this idea out there, right, that young people today are, you know, fickle employees and they're prone to switching jobs casually. Uh, but the reality is a little bit different. Um, it, is a, it is actually true that young people change jobs more often than older people, but that's always been true. And young people today are no more flighty than in the past. In fact, it's older workers who are moving more frequently than past generations of old. And if anything, the young are holding on to their jobs tighter than in the past, given the tougher economic environment. Similarly, it's true that young people today work fewer hours than they did in the past. But again, that's because the working hours of all age groups have seen a long-term decline. Uh, and this is something that, I mean, we've talked about this before, The especially as we talked about the labor shortage and so forth, um, the agency that folks have today to move from job to job. And that's not just young people. And in fact, people with more experience, more education, they tend to have more leverage in sh- um, shifting jobs because they're a hotter commodity right? I mean, companies are eager to hire somebody to fill the job. 
And if you're somebody out there that's got the nice padded resume and you're get a little bit of gray, you know, touch of gray going through the hair, they might be more interested in what you have to offer just because they know they're going to get somebody that maybe they don't have to train as much. But there, but there you go with the stereotypes. Why do you have to have the touch of gray? You're, you're, you're pointing <laughs> out that, as the article says, these stereotypes can – and really made up conflicts – can be genuinely destructive when they stand in the way of real understanding of generational differences, which shape our attitudes and behaviors on many key issues, religion, sexual activity, smoking, drinking alcohol, connection to political parties and trust in other people. So there you go. You just said, well, you know, and then you have the tent of gra- – there's that, that stereotype that we have that gets in the way of us really having the conversations that need to be had. That is the older generation – is moving just as much as the younger generation. The reason the younger generation isn't working as much is there aren't as many hours to be had to work, that the number of hours that people have worked across generations has been dropping for the last 30 years. So we're, we're again, we pointed out at, well, these people are lazy. Well, these people are getting advantage because they're older. They're making more money because of this. They're doing this. And what we do is we start then saying, well, these are the reasons why X, Y, and Z are happening. And to your point of, you know, causation and all that kind of stuff, that takes away from us looking at exactly what is happening. We start to talk in innuendos and stereotypes rather than discussing the facts as they are. And the facts are everybody's working less, which is ironic when we see, you know, the number of working shortage, worker shortages and everything else. But then there's that whole idea of making a profit. You know, I mean, I know that that my daughter is being told you can't have more than X amount of overtime. Well, yes, we know we're shorthanded, but you can't pick it up. You know, she's willing to work. And the company that she works for says, no, we're cutting off the overtime because we're worried about profits. So we're not discussing those issues because we're going in and falling into this ageism thing and pointing fingers instead of discussing what really is the problem. The the thing that I was thinking it would be saved until later in the show, but I'll just mention it now as I I heard this. We well, um, have to mention it now because by later in the show, I could forget everything because that's yes. part of being old too. <laughs> right? Okay. Well, don't stereotype <laughs> yourself now. Don't be mean to the old people. <laughs> they can remember things. Uh, not all old people have trouble with memory. Um, but even I have trouble with memory and I'm not very old. I don't either. I remember everything that I remember. Uh, Well, see, (laughs) um, there was this psychiatrist the other day. People ponder that. You always remember what you remember. Come on. What I have to say is more important. Uh, Sorry to interrupt. (laughs) What did did the psychiatrist have to say? Talking about personality types. And I thought it was very interesting because there's a lot of hubbub, you know, about, is there any validity to a personality type? You know, can it even be useful? And I thought their their descriptor applies here too, because it's about labels in general. And they said, you know, the reality is that labels, depending on the label, can be a totally valid starting point. The mistake we make is allowing them to be the final word and assuming that any one person can be boiled down to any one label is just. It, I mean, and it's not, I don't think this is an opinion and the psychiatrist pointed this out. It's just wrong. There are literally, you know, tens of thousands of components that go into making someone who they are. And to say that you can distill all of that down into one ultimate descriptor is pretty bold of anybody to claim. And I, and I think that's, But that's the point here is that same thing about personality types holds true to generational stereotypes, which is to say, well, because they're a boomer, they probably think X, Y, Z, you know, or ah, they're one of those darn Gen Zers, you know, they got to be this way. When talking about the meaning in life or being concerned with material things, the idea that millennials are particularly obsessed by material concerns is pretty much an accepted fact ever since the Time Magazine cover in 2013 called us the me, me, me generation. And in the 2017 book iGen, psychologist Gene Twenge wrote that young people today are very interested in becoming well-off and less focused on meaning than previous generations. It's so prevalent, Lance, that in an online survey of 20,000 people across 30 countries, 
they were able to confirm that the number one adjective most used to describe Generation Z, the one behind millennials, was materialistic. And it was only beat out by tech savvy. So they, the first thing that came to mind was tech savvy. The second thing was materialistic. However, it's a misread on reality. In a survey of young people, uh, they found that those people are twice as likely as older people to say it's important to them to be rich, but that's more a feature of youth than a true generational difference. Because when you look at multiple generations at the same age, you'll find that many young people across many generations all wanted to be rich. That's why I'm known as the friendly redneck liberal, because you can't put me in a box. And I drive my truck and wear my bow tie with my sweater vest. So <clears throat> it's wrong when you do that. It's bad because then you don't get into discuss things. For example, just throw this out as we in this segment, something to stew about during the commercial we talk about, oh, the young people, boy, they're, they're our social justice warriors. You know, they're out there fighting for what's right and everything else. But um, a your survey done just last year says that baby boomers are the most likely to have boycotted a company in the last 12 months because they don't agree with what they've done, while Gen Z is about half as likely. So hmm. there you go again, right? We're hmm. going to say, must be these young people out there because they're fighting, they're walking the streets. Yeah, well, I can't walk the streets anymore and protest, but I've got the money and I get, and where I decide where to spend my money has a lot of effect as well, right? And that's, and you opened my eyes to that four or five years ago when we did a show and you talked about the amount of time that young people donate because they don't have the money. So that's fair. But let's also talk about this, that just because younger people donate their time because A, they have more energy or B, they have more time than they have money, that doesn't mean that us older people who have some money aren't speaking out as well with our pocketbooks. Well, and I think that important note that the article says is, um, you know, the genesis for a lot of these issues related to, to generational stereotypes may in fact be mixing up life cycle stages in exchange for the effects of different generations. So it, it, it's lazy, laziness. So you mean to say in 30, 40 years when I'm gone, you're going to be thinking the same thing as I am now? I don't know about the same things because we are going to talk about that. Same a little attitudes. Bit. We're, we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, cause it could also be a disservice to assume that the generations are 100% alike. And part of, I think what the author points out today is it's just like we always say, right? It's, uh, never, never, and never always. The generations are not identical. Young people today are not 100% like baby boomers were when they were growing up or vice versa. But to also assume that they're totally different, that they've not have anything in common is also a disservice. And there is a dichotomy at work there that we have to take into account. So who is to blame for cancel culture? Uh, because this one might surprise you. And also, how are cultural norms shifting? Might that be a more accurate indicator of generational differences? And what about climate change? How do generational stereotypes prevent us from making meaningful progress on this critical issue? To find out, keep it here on The State of Us. And we'll be right back. Baby boomers are actually the ones that are most likely to have boycotted a company in the past 12 months, with Gen Z about half as likely. By this measure, contends the Wall Street Journal article, cancel culture is more of a middle age thing than it is a young thing. And the article points out at, at, at a point here that I think is very important to understand while some of these things have not changed drastically, in other words, the moving from job to job that, you know, baby boomers may have experienced when they were young versus millennials versus whoever, the thing that has changed is our ability to amplify those differences and our ability to, at scale, 
blast the megaphone. And of course, what I'm referring to here is social media. Um, that is a notable change, right? Some of these things existed and old people have been railing against young people, as Lance pointed out, all the way back uh, at least to Socrates. And I'd imagine that we can find documentation probably even before that when old people had cranky things to say about young people. Um, so it's it, not a new phenomenon. The difference is that good old Socrates didn't have Facebook at his fingertips to, you know, rant to literally, uh, you know, millions, hundreds of millions or billions of people. Um, his, his best bet was to talk to a, a crowd of a few folks and then let word of mouth do its part. But there wasn't even half as many people in the world as there are today when he lived. So, uh, just by nature of, even if he could reach the whole population of the world, you couldn't, you know, impact, uh, just the sheer number of people. So I think that's a huge, a huge thing that we have to keep in mind. It doesn't mean that, um, millennials are any more or less X. It just means that we all, because we've also talked about this, that the percentage of old people using Facebook continues to increase. We all, every generation is susceptible to uh, using this to amplify false narratives about generation. Cancel culture is generally, Lance, right? Associated with young people. But in reality, I mean, just by the nature of people boycotting companies for, you know, behaving in a certain way, it's more likely that baby boomers will do that than it is younger generations, right? And that makes sense. I mean, when you think about it, because as you get older, you start to have more time. You've raised your family. You've settled down in your career. You have a routine. And so I think you become, and, and this is going to be, you know, you throw this out there for a discussion, you have more time to keep up with what's going on. I remember when I was, uh, when, when I was little, when I was probably nine, 10 years old, um, it was the middle of the Vietnam war and <clears throat> my 30 ish young thirties mother was busy working while my dad was in grad school, had three children. And I said, you know, mom, you know, what's this and da, 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 and what's going on and what do you think of this? And she goes, I don't know. I'm so busy raising kids right now. I really can't keep up on what's going on. And she was working on a college campus. So she kind of did. And part of what she was doing, I think, was protecting me from what was going on. But there's some truth to that because I realized when I had my children and I was working and I was trying to establish myself in my career, I didn't have time. It wasn't that I wasn't interested in what was going on out in the world. I just didn't have time to deal with it because I had put other things in front of those things. And now that I'm older, it's, you know, I, I can't sleep. I, I, you know, prostate doesn't work. I got to go to the bathroom. I'm getting up. I'm watching the news. I'm reading more because I have time to do that. So I'm more aware of what's going on around the world than I was when I was younger. Let's talk about cultural norms as well, Lance, because this is a big one. It is true that young people are generally at the leading edge of change in cultural norms around race, immigration, sexuality, gender identity, etc. For example, eight in 10 members of Generation Z say there is nothing wrong with sexual relations between people of the same sex compared with around three in 10 of those born before World War II. Young people are less set in their ways and more comfortable with change than older people. But, this is important, the gaps between young and old on emergent cultural issues today are really no larger than they were in the past. Uh, indeed, in many cases, there were bigger gaps between baby boomers in their youth and their parents than we see between young and old today. For example, in 1990, over 60% of people born before World War II agreed that it was, quote, much better for everyone if the man was the achiever outside the home and the woman takes care of the home and family, end quote, while under 30% of boomers agreed. Or you could flip that around and say 7 in 10 boomers disagreed. Similarly, 8 in 10 members of Gen Z say there's nothing wrong with sexual relations between members of the same gender. So 
the point is, right, and not that those are a one-for-one trade-off, but on cultural norms, it is not at all unusual for young people to have more divergent social views than their parents. That is historically very common. Well, and it, it, anecdotally here, in the in the early 70s when I was growing up, that's the end, beginning, middle of the hippies, right? I mean, it's I was part of that on the younger side of that hippie generation, and I grew my hair long. And that was, oh my gosh, I, you know, and I remember my dad looking around at the dinner table and in one of his uh, rare moments of noticing everything. No, that's not true. You noticed everything. We never got away with anything. Um, he said, he looked at my mother and said, I thought we had two girls and two boys. How come I can't see anybody's eyes? Their hair is all the same length. Because that was, you know, and so he didn't make me get my hair cut, but I had my hair in a ponytail, you know, and it, I carried that with me because then when I became a coach and now I cut my hair and, you know, became a teacher and I used to, because I played tennis a lot, I, I would buzz cut it when everybody else then was growing their hair long. I was buzz cutting mine because I was like, oh, I got to take three showers a day because I'm doing all this activity and I hate you know, my hair and washing it and drying it. But then I would have, <laughs> man, I, I, such, I, had, such a chore. I had a young man who played golf for me who had long hair down his back and I made him keep it clean. That was my rule, but it was no big deal. And the older coaches and teachers at the high school said, aren't you going to make him get his hair cut? You're going to let him represent our school with that long hair. And that was in the mid eighties. But because I had had long hair and I knew that, my hair was just a symbol of me rebelling against society. Right. It's like, well, that didn't bother me. He keeps it clean. He wears it in a ponytail. He puts a cap on. It's not like he's flicking it out of his face or whatever. No, that's not, you know, we, I have a girl's golf team. I don't make them get their hair cut. You know, and the older people said, well, no, because they're girls. I'm saying, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, so, I mean, to your point, right? I mean, I think we all – when we're younger tend to be a little feistier and most people settle down. Some of us don't, we still fight the man as many opportunities as we can. Um, but yeah, that's just, that's just the ebb and flow, right? Of life. That, that young man who is now an adult and a parent, he wears a business suit and has short hair and keeps it, you know, looking nice because that's what he's gone into. It didn't hurt anybody that his hair was long. It doesn't, you know, and then I think that's where we start to, you know, that's like I laugh when these kids all say, well, you know, we're doing stuff. No, we had holes in our jeans too. We just put patches on them. You know, I mean, it's like, it's like, oh, we're doing something different than your generation. No, you're not. You're doing the same thing we did. Well, and don't, don't we forget that. If somebody grows their hair long to rebel against society and then you fight them on it, it's only going to make them keep it longer. I, I just I mean, just like a just a basic psychology thing. <laughs> if you don't want their hair to be long, probably the best thing you could do is tell them that, oh, man, I really like your hair long, <laughs> you know, because then they'll go cut it the next day and be like, oh, I'll show you. Why did I start wearing you know? bow ties? Because the superintendent recommended that all men start wearing ties. So I said, okay, fine. I'll, I'll go along. I'll wear a bow tie. I mean, that's And he just... walked up to me and goes, that's not what I meant. And I said, oh, you said a tie because it was my way to stick it to authority. Uh-huh. That's Exactly. I mean, to your point, right? If you want somebody to change something, say that you accept. And there we go back to our, why are we breaking up these generation things? We're big on the state of us of talking about how we need to get along, right? So if we don't put up these generational barriers by classifying people, now we break down the stereotypes and we can start to talk to one another and we start to accept one another and we can have these discussions that we feel here on this show are very important to solving some of the real problems. Among the more destructive generational myths is the idea that older generations don't care about climate change and the fate of the planet. But this stereotype collapses in on itself, Lance, when you look at the evidence. 
Six in 10 Americans in all age groups say that climate change, biodiversity loss, and other environmental issues are big enough problems that they justify significant changes to people's lifestyles. In fact, younger people are most pessimistic about the impact they themselves can have in tackling climate change. Among baby boomers, 53% disagree with the idea that changing their behavior is pointless, or 47% agree, as compared with only 34% of millennials. Um, exaggerating the differences between generations on climate is a self-defeating approach to a potentially existential challenge. Now, I will say, just as a, a caveat on the whole climate change thing here, the, we've talked about this before on The State of Us, uh, and Lance has uh, disproven his own generation stereotype in uh, you know, questioning exactly how much effect any one of us can have on climate change. Um, I think that's a whole separate conversation. But the point of this, less so that detail in the last bit, is that if six in 10 Americans of all age groups say that climate change um, is something that justifies significant changes to their everyday life, then the proposition that older generations don't care about climate change and the fate of the planet is a lie. I mean, it's just not true. If a majority of the generation cares about it enough to make changes in their everyday life, I don't think that you can then make the blanket statement and say they don't care. You could say some of them don't care or a minority don't care. But when you look at baby boomers um, and you look at the breakdown here of percentage of U.S. adults who say um, that climate change or excuse me, percentage of U.S. adults that think the rise in world temperature caused by greenhouse effect is extremely or very dangerous, 58%, 59% of baby boomers say that. So uh, again, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't know how you could make the contention as a whole that they don't care. Well, and if you're doing that, right, if you're blaming somebody else for the problem, to your point of your psychology there, you're pushing me away from being part of the solution, aren't you? I mean, if you're going to, if you're, you're going to assume, your own responsibility, true for right. the problem. But if you're assuming, well, you're the problem, blah, 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 well, fine, screw you. See if I do anything to help you. I mean, that's just the normal human reaction. So you're defeating your own purpose, and it's a lie. As the survey said, <laughs> it's a it's a lie. We're, it's not true, we, right? And it's self defeating. <laughs> so it's just bad in every way. Um, but let's talk about a couple things that are true, notably the wealth gap and the importance of issues that get overlooked because of all these flashy generational myths that we spend time on. To find out what those are, keep it here on The State of Us. We'll be right back. The author of this Wall Street Journal piece, which you can read at thestateofus.org, contends that generational myths are also dangerous because they distract us from true changes caused by the undeniably tougher economic circumstances facing younger generations. Baby boomers enjoyed significantly improved incomes in middle age, earning around 25% more compared with the silent generation born between 1980, 1928 and 1945 when both cohorts were 45 to 49 years old. But Gen Xers had 5% lower real incomes than boomers when they were 45 to 49, while millennials earned 5% less than Gen Xers at 30 to 34. So there is some truth here, right? I mean, as far as being able to earn money, it's gotten tougher. Because when baby boomers were in their mid-40s, Lance, they owned 40% of all wealth in the United States. But when Gen X reached the same average age, they only owned around 15%, according to a 2019 analysis of Federal Reserve data. A larger part of the difference can be explained by the long boom in housing prices and the changing profile of home ownership. In the U.S., millennials are around half as likely as baby boomers, to be homeowners. As a result, people in developed countries increasingly doubt that today's young people will be better off than their parents. 
the proportion of Americans who think it's unlikely their kids will have a better future rose from 25% in 1999, one in four, to 40% by 2019, or four in 10. So, so rather than pointing fingers, that should be the genesis for our discussion right there, right? The facts. Let's, let's talk here. Don't blame me or I'm going to blame my parents because you blame me. The blame game gets us nowhere. Let's work with the facts that are pointed out here. Well, we talk a lot on the state of us, Lance, I think, about in order to solve a problem, we at the very least must understand its genesis. And when we use generational stereotypes to blame other people, that doesn't really solve anything, right? All it does is make us feel better that it wasn't our fault that this happened. Somebody take responsibility, right? Now I'm going to rage against the machine a little bit here. That's all you're asking for somebody to do. Somebody step up and say, you know what? It's my Ev- fault. Now let's fix it. Everybody take responsibility. Let's, just, let's fix it. Okay. Now let's fix it. But we, until we take, into your point, until we, colloquial we, take responsibility, we can't fix it. If you're busy playing the blame game, nothing's being done to fix the problem. So we all need to step up and say, we are the problem. I'm thinking of that song, We Are the World, right? We are the world and we can solve the problem. We can feed the children. We can, you know, live aid and, and you know, back, back in, in the 80s. We said we can do this. We're the problem. We can do it. And now we're just... 30 years later, we're just pointing fingers and saying, yeah, it's not our fault. It's your fault. And so you fix it. And nothing's getting done. And one of the- we're not as optimistic, right? That's correct. One of the other um, things that's- Wait a minute. Does that lead? I'm sorry. I'm I'm, I'm I'm being a very, very bad (laughs) example of a baby boomer. But um, I'm filling out all the stereotypes here. Well, somebody has to. So. But sure, why not me? Um, There's your responsibility. I, I, I'm somebody's doing my part. Do it, so. I'm doing my part. I will I'll take the blame for this. But I lost my train of thought. So. <laughs> well, that's you're you're really you're really nailing this. I, I am. I'm doing it. I'm doing it great. Let, let me get this let me get this thing in edgewise here now. If I can just remember what the thing was, I'd get it in. (laughs) Oh, dear. Well, mental health was the last thing that we wanted to mention because this is another one. The wealth gap and mental health frequently get overlooked. That's what I was going to say. Oh, okay. Well, guys, we're on the same page. There's also a real difference between generations in the frequency of mental health disorders, particularly among young women. A 2019 study shows that The proportion of U.S. adolescents reporting symptoms consistent with major depression in the last 12 months increased from 8.7% in 2005 to 13.2% in 2017. There were no corresponding increases among other age groups over this period, suggesting that the cause might lie in the growing centrality of smartphones and social media among the young. But that's exactly where I was going, right? The genesis of positivity is admitting that there's a problem and that you're a part of it and therefore taking ownership and you can change it. And I think that leads now to all the mental health problems that we're seeing is young people are throwing up their arms and saying, there's nothing I can do about this. And so therefore it's just always going to be bad. And I, I just don't know what life's going to get me and bring me. Whereas if you accept part of the responsibility and we all agree, then we can all be part of the solution. And if we have a positive climate, I think it takes care. And maybe that's a little, you know, kumbaya-ish of me. But I think we have a more positive climate of thinking and feeling and reaction to one another. It takes away at least some, if not many, of those emotional issues that people are dealing with because we look around it's like nobody believes me nobody's going to help me nobody's this is just going to get worse nobody understands me whereas if we were all accepting of of one another and didn't point fingers at each other 
we could help each other deal with the issues that we have. Just going to rail uh, a little bit against the younger generation since I am one of them and just say that, and, and I mean, really it's anybody across generations, not just younger ones, but we've talked about how um, holistically Gen Z tends to be a little more pessimistic than previous generations, often citing that they just have a clearer understanding of reality than older generations do, you know, and therefore uh, their pessimism comes from a place of fact. And what I would say is, well, another fact is that having a negative disposition predispositions a negative outcome. In other words, if the genesis of our understanding for the world is negative, it is more likely that the world will continue to be negative, that your life will see more negativity in it. If our outlook, if the genesis of our outlook is positive, we know, again, scientifically, and you're welcome to look this up, that it is far more likely that you will be happier. And if you're happier, you'll be more productive. So if productivity is that ultimate thing that we're after being an effective society, then positivity is a natural extension of making that happen. And if we all did a little more of that, not just young people, but old people as well, it'd be really interesting to see how that might change not just our lives, but the lives of everybody, society. We might all be a little happier. And if we were happier, we might be more likely to take on some of these complicated issues. Because when life seems stressful, you know, we just, oh, we don't have, to Lance's point, we don't have time for that. You know, I'm busy with, I got these problems in my own life I got to worry about. I can't think about climate change. I can't think about the wealth gap. I can't think about mental health. Those things are, you know, depressing and awful. And I don't got time for that when I got all this other stuff I'm already worried about. Well, this is perhaps a step in the right direction. So why did we have this conversation today, Lance? What was the point? Um, well, the genesis was that we needed to do a show, but then we also <laughs> talked about it because fair enough. True Chat's mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And I think we've done that today. And I was interested in this topic because I don't like putting all these labels on people. I just it just bothers me. He's a natural no resistor, end. right? And I just don't like it. And I think we've proven today that it's not really good for us to be doing this. That there are some true things here. But for the most part, it's getting in the way of us solving problems, and that's what we feel is important, and we need to solve problems. If you agree with us and you like the show today, tell others about it. And when they say, well, where can I find this interesting show to listen to, you tell them. As a podcast, we're on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcast, and Everywhere podcasts are found. The State of Us is available Tuesdays and Thursdays as a podcast, first thing in the mornings, and heard across the country on AM and FM radio stations on the weekends. Uh, I think I, I take the cake today, I believe. I had a final tally of eight to six, so uh, I can finally n not be such a loser. <laughs> so <laughs> It's the genesis of a winning streak. Oh, <laughs> well, as you would say, the co the competition is over now. So <laughs> I know, I'm just showing that I can use the word. And I had it at a 7-7 seven, seven tie, but that's okay. Oh, okay. I'm all sure right. when Bradley gets done, I will probably have lost eight to four. <laughs> well, that's all that really matters, that's right? That's right. That so is the, exactly right. The final, the final record mm -hmm. uh, that, will, that will live for posterity uh, will show the clear that superiority will live for infamy in the of millennials over boomers and exactly. their ability to use vocabulary. For the State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Special thanks to producer extraordinaire Gen Zer Bradley Butch. And thank you, our audience from all generations across the spectrum of political ideology for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in. Thestateofus.org.